When I was a boy, I believed that the sea was boundless and indestructible to human pressures. Now I know better. Fish living there because they destroyed their habitat. As a nation, if we're undermining the traditional maritime use, we need for climate change, land-based source of pollution, habitat loss and degradation. Uh, you taking away somebody's rights and liberties. There's going to be a moment of truth for everybody. Everybody says, put it out there. Who cares what happens out there? Let's just get it out of my sight. What's on Mars, but we can't figure out what's in our oceans. Most of the world's coral reefs are bleached or dying. There are dead zones the size of small states off our coast. Most of the biggest fish have been harvested, and there are places where jellyfish have become the catch of the day. And all at a time when we have to deal with aquaculture, wind and wave energy, even oil and gas exploration that are staking claims in our waters. But I have also learned there's a smarter, more lasting course than the one we're on. At a time when our demands of the ocean are expanding at an unprecedented rate, and the failures of our outdated, piecemeal way of managing this life-giving resource are becoming abundantly clear. The time has come for a fresh approach based on stewardship through cooperation. In the small fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, Aaron Longton and his colleagues are making a living off the sea in what they hope is a lasting way, a way that serves not only the community of Port Orford, but the sea life that sustains them in return. Port Orford's long-term outlook for the waters that feed them is part of a blossoming movement to take better care of the ocean for the good of all. It is a movement of scientists, businesses, fishermen, farmers, governments, and citizens who care for the sea. When you rub it one way, you'll notice that it's smooth. And if you rub it the other way, it gets a little bit rough. It feels like sandpaper, right? In 2010, the United States adopted its first ever national ocean policy. A policy that now calls for bringing together people from across the societal spectrum to carry out a new, far-sighted strategy for sustaining the country's ocean, coasts, and Great Lakes. It is founded on a branch of conservation, more formally known as ecosystem-based management, more simply, as a common sense approach to preserving life. It is backed by science and based on the needs of the human community in balance with that of its ecological provider, the sea. So we have things that happen right here in Iowa that end up affecting folks thousands of miles away, fishermen trying to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Shipping is extremely important to this economy. We generate about a million jobs in California. One in eight jobs in Southern California is associated with the port activity. And then nationwide, it's between three and four million jobs. So I see marine spatial planning as a tool that will help ports uh, delineate the area where traditional maritime uses are going to be protected. Scientific research. Do we need and it? We're finally getting it. Thanks to our reserve. If it's not too late. No, it's not too late. Our I fishery, said if. Yes, it's not. To meet some of the movement's pioneers, we will journey from coast to coast, as well as the land between. From the fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, to farmers along the Mississippi River, to the Gulf of Mexico. 
from divers in the Florida Keys to whale researchers and industrial shippers in Massachusetts Bay. All are now practicing a new philosophy of marine stewardship, of prosperity through preservation. Okay, we're now inside the Stillwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. This is an um, 850-some square mile marine protected area off the coast of Massachusetts. It'll stretch from the tip of Cape Cod all the way up to just about New Hampshire. And it's an extremely productive area, one of the most productive areas in the Gulf of Maine. Okay. She might come up right here again. You can just drift forward a little. Stellwagen Bank is a place of unusual richness, a mixing bowl of upwelling currents that brings vital nutrients from the deep and spreads them like fertilizer across the surface of the sea. These nutrients form the foundation of a vast food pyramid built on the uncountable masses of tiny plankton, feeding multitudes of fish and seabirds, marine mammals and people. When in 1992, Stellwagen Bank became a National Marine Sanctuary, it inherited a long and busy history of boat traffic. The sanctuary's waters are plied by all forms of vessels, and that has posed a growing challenge for the largest and oldest residents of Stellwagen. Well, the problem that we're trying to deal with in, in this particular piece is really North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales and finback whales, all these endangered species, being struck and killed by large commercial vessels. By that I mean uh, ships that are 300 gross tons or more. There's more and more cargo ships going in different directions from overseas and up and down the coastline. There's a lot of recreational uses, there's commercial uses. A lot of demand for wind power to be done out on the ocean. We now have two offshore uh, liquefied natural gas terminals off the coast of Boston. What was shaping up to be a collision of commerce and conservation at Stellwagen turned on a new path of cooperation. And there's all these competing uses for the ocean, and they're all valid, and there's stakeholders standing behind all of them, and we need to find a way to help them coexist and to uh, make sure that we preserve our resources for future generations. Knowing that some of the rarest whales in the world were dying in the shipping lanes of Boston Harbor, the Massachusetts Port Authority, Dave Wiley, and the shipping industry together set out to save them. The most immediate questions were simple to ask, yet hard to answer. Where do the whales feed? Where do they congregate? Where are the commercial ships traveling? And how fast? The answers eventually came by way of millions of little bits of data. All vessels, 300 gross ton or larger, are required to carry an AIS system or automatic identification system that was developed between us and the Coast Guard. And the way that we've done this is we've set up three antennas across the sanctuary. And the idea is that we can triangulate and get full coverage throughout the entire sanctuary. So what happens is the ship comes through the shipping lane or any other parts of the sanctuary. It transmits a signal every two to 10 seconds, giving its ship information plus also its latitude, longitude, and speed, and where it's heading, and what type of vessel it is. Stellwagen's lab collected more than 150 million records each year, pinpointing all the large ships within the sanctuary. Coming up, coming towards us. Determining the whale's whereabouts required different skills. Okay. The other one is still on the left, even though the clipper's over the back of there. I'm saying you don't want to tag the belly up one. You want to keep coming off balance, just like this. Just like this. Okay, right, tag. Good placement. Wait till she brings her back up. You're right on the right spot. 
Let her, wait, let her bring it up. Let her bring the back up. Let her bring the back up now. Oh. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Whale researchers once relied solely on boats and planes, yeah. catching mere surface glimpses of a creature whose wanderings reached to the hidden depths of the sea. With the help of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Wiley and his crew employed a new device called a D-tag, a miniature computer harmlessly fastened to the whales with suction cups. Swing to the right a little bit. Swing to the right. No, no. Under the bow. On the right. Okay, come to the left. 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 Down. Perfect. Oh, oh man. Beautiful. Wow. Very beautiful. All right. <laughs> when the tag detaches from the whale, a radio beacon leads scientists to its location to retrieve it. The D-TAG has granted us a far more intimate picture of their underwater world. This animation is based on the information gathered from the D-TAG. Here we see the feeding behavior of humpback whales as it has rarely been seen before. But the D-tag allows us to get down to the bottom and see that, in fact, they are doing this sort of rolling behavior and feeding on what you're seeing here, which is the sand lance right along the bottom, um, sometimes during the day, mainly at night. And superimposed in here is some fixed fishing gear, which you'll see here is a gill net, and then also the surface lines going up to the uh, surface. So as you can see, this animal did a really good job avoiding um, the potential entanglement. Other whales are not so lucky. North Atlantic right whales are found typically feeding near the surface, at a depth of 15 to 20 meters or less. 15 meters is also the keel depth of large vessels entering the port of Boston, putting whales into strike range. With as few as 350 members of its kind remaining, the death of even a single breeding female can tip the species towards extinction. So it's at that real turning point in terms of will the population survive or will it not. Each individual in that population is important. So one of the next things we wanted to look at is how serious of a problem is this. So another visualization here is showing you uh, again, the sanctuary is dropped into 3D here, and these are nautical mile uh, grid cells. And the height of the, um, each of the cells that you're seeing is, in fact, the dense areas where there's the most population of whales. Thompson and Wiley overlaid the shipping lanes and saw a collision waiting to happen. And the shipping lanes went right through the prime habitat. So I think you don't need to be a scientist to understand that that's not a good thing and that that increases the likelihood of a whale getting hit by the ships. There were also areas in the sanctuary that were less used by whales. So we decided it'd be a good idea, very smart, uh, to try to move the shipping lanes from areas that whales used a lot to areas that the whales used with much less frequency. Wiley took his idea of moving the shipping lanes to the port operators group, presenting his data and offering solutions that were good for the whales. But were they good for the shippers? Because it was the first time that, you know, we'd ever been approached that, at that level uh, in that detail to figure out what was going on in the ocean. You, know, you can't manage it if you don't know who's out there and what they're doing. So, our initial response to the uh, the proposed shift in the in the traffic lanes uh, was guarded, and then uh, we had some concerns uh, for navigational safety. With a clearer picture of all the pieces, both the shipping industry and the whale champions realized their needs were not so incompatible after all. 
they would have some more questions, we'd rework the data. And after about six months, we came to an agreement of what we thought would be a particular um, configuration for the shipping lanes that would give us very good conservation benefit for right whales and the other endangered whales, and also would have minimal impact upon the shipping industry. The lane was shifted north to come in a direction like this. This would represent what the new shipping lane looks like as opposed to the old one. I mean, there have not been any incidents, so. Boston is not one of the largest ports in the United States, but it's, it's a vibrant port. And the thought being that, you know, if we're gonna continue to have traffic in and out of port, which we are, then let's take some steps to reduce the risk of a, of a strike. The last thing that we want to do is to, to harm one of the animals with a ship. And, and, and nobody wants to do that. The shippers don't want to do that. The pilots don't want to do that when they're on the ship. So we, we want to take the steps and re-educate the, the captains and everybody involved so that that risk is, is reduced. Yeah. I think it's much better when you have buy-in from the industry on this sorts of decisions and if everyone from the Port of Boston was screaming and yelling and calling their politicians, it can really derail this sort of process to the detriment of the whales. There's been close to 100% compliance with the ships following the, the uh, voluntary lanes and I think that's testimony to how much the industry really embraced it. Boston became the first port in the nation to change its shipping routes to protect marine mammals, reducing the whale's risk of being struck by more than 80 percent. But there would be little time for celebration. Because of our long-standing failure to develop comprehensive plans for the ocean, there came a new and costly problem from out of the blue. The project is a real good example of why marine spatial planning is really a key for um, managing the ocean in the future. Because at the same time we are moving the shipping lanes, the liquid natural gas companies through the Deepwater Port Act were working to put two deepwater ports uh, just a few miles from the sanctuary border. And in the area that we're moving the shipping lanes to. Now you can't have shipping lanes and deep water ports coexisting. So now we had in conflict a project that was very important for endangered whale conservation and of course the LNG very important to the nation for energy independence and security. So he said, well, you know, we've just moved the shipping lanes to try to reduce the risk, and now you're going to be bringing these big, fast ships through the sanctuary. That's going to increase risk. So we need to do something to keep that from happening. Again, the questions to Stellwagen's new dilemma would eventually be answered by the whales. For in fact, the whales were speaking amongst themselves, as were most of the creatures of the sea. A phenomenon of vital, underwater chatter that humanity had only lately begun to decipher. Well, there are no deaf marine vertebrates. Fish, they're all hearing. Whales, they're all hearing. Now we're discovering that all the invertebrates, the lobsters and the crabs and the shrimp, they're all doing it too. In the ocean, everybody's listening to sound and most everybody's making sounds. Bioacoustic specialist Christopher Clark has been researching ocean communication for nearly 40 years. And with ocean noise doubling every decade, he is not liking what he is hearing. Finally, in the beginning of the 21st century, we're all waking up to the fact like, oh, noise from shipping, from oil and gas exploration, from recreational boats, all that stuff generates sound. And it's all smogging. It's influencing the, the habitat in which these animals are trying to exist. Research on ocean noise pollution has raised serious questions about its impact on marine life. 
such as its potential to disrupt the schooling and spawning of fish, or preventing young corals from finding their home reef to build upon, or its profound impact on whales. What I'm going to show you now is a movie where we're actually taking real data collected in the ocean. It shows whales and it shows ships. Each one of these lightning bugs or stars represents the position of a right whale and the space over which that glow, that aura, radiates is the space within which that animal can communicate with other whales. Now we're going to actually put the real ships in there. We know what the acoustic footprints look like from the ships and those are going to be illustrated in color and so the, the brighter it is, the louder they are. And those are ships coming out of Boston going through Cape Cod Canal. Here comes a big ship from down from Halifax. And notice the space, this is what I call the footprint, this is the acoustic footprint that, that that ship is imposing into this habitat, into the acoustic habitat of the whales. So if you don't see the, the starlight coming through from the whales that are up here, that means that the noise is so loud they can't be heard and their communication is shut off. So the ocean that 50 years ago, for these animals that lived to be 100 years, when they were teenagers, the ocean was quiet. They could hear each other across ocean basins or hundreds of miles. We're drowning these organisms in noise. So their social systems don't function. The ecosystem gets torn apart. So this is getting to the point where we're talking about a noise budget, an ocean noise budget. So you get the shipbuilders to say, OK, we know how to build fire ships. What about all the noisy ones right now? One thing that you can do really simple, slow down, right? It saves whales because you don't run them over. It's quieter when you slow it down. Clark's expertise on ocean acoustics made him the logical collaborator when Stellwagen began looking for ways to protect the whales while accommodating Accelerate Energy's deepwater gas ports. Well, Accelerate Energy looked at the market in the northeast U.S. as far as there was a great energy need here. And we have a solution to bring an incremental supply of natural gas to uh, the northeast. And that's where we developed the Northeast Gateway Deepwater Port. We knew coming in that the whales would be an issue. So I got this phone call from these guys at Accelerate going, hey, you know what, time is money. Every day, we're not in the water. That's, that's costing me a million dollars and people sitting around waiting to start building this terminal. Fix it. And guess what? It can't work 80% of the time. It's got to be bulletproof. With Accelerate's financial clout, Cornell's bioacoustic know-how, Woods Hole engineers and Stellwagen's marine biologists all on board, the unlikely collaboration took to the water, developing the nation's first ever acoustic whale detection system. And they will pick up right whale calls. Right whales make this particular call called the right whale up call. It kind of goes whoop. And that's a call that they use for contacting each other. And this particular piece of uh, equipment will record the sound of a right whale making that call. It shoots it up from the surface to a uranium link to a satellite, downloads it to Cornell. Cornell then University Bioacoustic Lab then will identify it. Yes, that is or that is not a right whale call. That's the first arrival there. And, there and, there. and then in this case, the LNG companies are notified that there's a whale in their path. We made it work. We can now listen to the ocean. We have a network of these buoys right in the middle of the shipping loops. And these are positioned about 10 miles apart, so they overlap, and they can listen for whales throughout this area. As soon as the vessel enters the shipping lane, we reduce our speed to 12 knots or less. We put personnel on the bridge of the vessel, and they start generally scanning for marine mammals. Accelerate Energy is covering all of the costs for the whale detection system 
for the life of the LNG terminals, which is planned for 30 years. It represents about 1% of the total operating budget for Accelerate's liquefied natural gas port. Examples where we have it coming over multiple units? So this has yeah. given Cornell an opportunity to, to do things that they've not been able to do by having an array and having uh, year-round funding. And it won't surprise me if Dr. Clark doesn't find a way to develop a network that will reach further than Boston Harbor. I'm hoping that you know we'll uh, have some part in that in the future. I think all the people in that group uh, came away being a little bit different as a result of the process. Um, you know, certainly the, the conservationists and scientists could understand the industry point of view a little bit better. Certainly industry could understand the science better and, and the conservation need. So if we work together on something in the future, which I'm sure we will and we actually are, um, I think it'll go about a bit easier. We have more confidence in each other to, to act in a, a straightforward and honest manner, I think, at this point. The success at Stellwagen has illuminated the power and promise that collaboration, better science, and better planning hold for our ocean. So I see this as a huge opportunity to finally pay attention to the ocean. There are a lot of people that are knowledgeable about the ocean, and what we're starting to do is sort of integrate that into, into sort of a more comprehensive vision of how does it work? and how do our actions impact that ecosystem. Those looking to save whales and support industry in Massachusetts Bay have converged on a surprisingly painless solution. Rarely, though, does the intersection of ocean stewardship and societal demands flow so smoothly. And nowhere has the challenge been so deeply tested than in America's most beloved coral reef. The Florida Keys are the fossilized tips of a vast coral kingdom some 4,500 stepping stones leading south in the Caribbean blue. Majestic, three-dimensional features constructed by multitudes of tiny animals. These reefs are the equivalent of an oceanic rainforest, sheltering creatures wearing every color in the rainbow. but also they are an ever busier playground and workplace of sightseers and divers, sailors and fishermen. 20 years ago, a fisherman of the Florida Keys named Billy Causey took what would amount to the leap of a lifetime. Causey went from earning his living catching fish to protecting those same fish as the first manager of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. The response from Causey's own community has come to symbolize the rough waters of marine conservation in a world of competing uses. Billy was, uh, in this hemisphere, probably hated to the uh with the locals as much as Castro was to the, the Miami Latins. And at that time, there was a lot of public angst. I mean, everybody saw it as a, a restriction of their rights and liberties to go out and fish whatever they wanted to, whenever they wanted to, wherever they wanted to. And you start taking away somebody's rights and liberties, there's, there's, going, to be, there's going to be a moment of truth for everybody. The process got so contentious in 1992 that I was hung in effigy. And I, I don't really like to talk about that because it was a tough day for me. So I was part of the crowd with the, with the rope and the crosses at first outside of Billy Causey's window when they, went, when they hung him in effigy. As you can imagine, people, first they were concerned about all of a sudden this big federal footprint that surrounded their community. 
They were concerned about what a sanctuary was going to do to their livelihoods, and they were concerned about whether or not they should engage in a stakeholder-driven process. After three major ship groundings in the Keys within one month, the legislation immediately routed large ships away from the fragile coral reefs and banned oil drilling within the sanctuary. But the effects from global climate change, water pollution, and many other demands kept taking its toll on the Florida Keys. I used to get uh, calls by the dive operators who would be complaining about the charter fishing boats that would troll close to the reef and their fish would get hooked on and they would wrap around divers and I would get calls from families that were upset that people were spearfishing right next to them at, at one of the reefs or I'd get calls from dive charter boats who had tropical fish collectors collecting right on the top of the reefs where they were. So there were all these conflicts in these areas. Kazi forged ahead, forming the nation's first Sanctuary Advisory Council, bringing in respected representatives of all that had a stake in the health of the Keys. Tourism is the number one industry here in the Keys. People come down here to go fishing. They come down here to go diving. They come down here to enjoy our climate, our environment, to enjoy the beaches. They come down here just to hang out in Key West. The tourists that come down here spend $1.2 billion every year. And that's before the economic multipliers kick in. So someone has to be here to keep a pulse on the, this environment while the 4 million visitors come down every year to enjoy this environment. We have a public process here. It's called a sanctuary. The council's council solution that, was to partition the Keys' council. most critical areas. I understand where you're coming from. Borrowing some time-tested techniques from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the council adopted a special set of marine zones to protect the sensitive reefs from overuse and to separate conflicting uses. And ironically, in separating the people. It brought them together. Bringing people together to talk about a problem is step one. I can only speak from my experiences here and how it was done here, and it was done right. The protecting of sensitive marine areas, that seems to cover a lot of the concerns. Everybody's involved, and everybody gets to hear what everybody has to say. It works out fine for us. I don't know any charter boat fishermen here that would say that the uh, sanctuary preservation areas have hurt their business. Um, uh, I don't know anybody that would say that. Then as time goes on, I guess, you know, you do some soul searching, I know I did. Just do, you know, was I right, was I wrong? Anybody who doesn't re revisit a decision that, that you, you have a question about it, it makes a big mistake in life. Uh, so I, I revisited that revisited that decision and said, well, maybe it was the right thing because I'm still catching fish here. I'm not fishing there, but I'm, I'm still catching fish there. So what did it really take away from me? So is it really hurting me? No, and if it does some good, so much the better. And then when you see that it does some good, they said, hey, maybe we should close some other areas. Protecting both their businesses and the ecosystem, in 2001, the Sanctuary Advisory Council established the no-take Tortugas Ecological Reserve. At that time, the largest fully protected marine area in the country. The collaboration in the Keys has since gained worldwide praise as a model for marine reserve design. Now what's really exciting is that the Tortugas, which are to the west of us from right here about 70 miles, are upstream of the Florida Keys. As the current moves between us and Cuba, a series of counterclockwise gyres spin off. And anything spawning in the Tortugas is spread in the larvae. So those larvae are carried all the way up the Keys and then they're sprinkled into the grass beds, into the nursery areas. They grow up there, they move out to the reefs, and they start spawning again. This past year, we saw the reestablishment 
of a fish spawning aggregation site, which were mutton snapper, a very important species, to the fishing community here in the Keys. And they're back in huge numbers, which is a huge success. It really worked out you know, in our best interest that they're protecting these resources because what they protect helps us in the long run. So um, we have a really good relationship with the sanctuary, Billy, the sanctuary, everyone. You know, we've always worked with them really well. The NGOs, World Wildlife Fund, Nature Conservancy, groups like that, they all have representatives usually at sanctuary meetings and we all work together and, you know, we do what's best for the environment. If it makes sense, the fishermen are for it. If it doesn't make sense to us, you know, we could have a problem with it. But uh, in general, you know, we hash these things out and uh, we try and do what's best for the resources. But you, you will still have some people to this day that believe that, no, we have some inevitable right to fish wherever, whenever, for whatever, and catch how many we want. Because the fish are always going to be there. That's bull. I mean, why is the fish always going to be there? Who says that? Where is it written? But we have seen a turn in this community, and we've seen people that realize that we're not going to put them out of business. Our job is to keep them in business. Our job is to make sure that there are fish and, and other resources here for the future. Our job is to make sure that the dive industry has mooring buoys to tie up to when they go to the reef so they don't destroy the very resource that brings their customers to the Keys. Our job is to make sure that these groups have something here in the future to make a living off. Despite initial struggles and hostilities, the Keys' future has turned on the strength of leadership and teamwork. Successfully establishing the United States' first ever comprehensive ocean plan. No longer fighting over the last fish or dive site, the Sanctuary Advisory Council is now directing their energy towards eliminating water pollution to protect the Keys for the long term. And this is what I get up every day to go to work to do, is to say, what can I do locally and what can I do regionally and how can I influence what's happening on a global scale? And our ocean policy, our national ocean policy now, gives us a framework endorsed by the highest levels of this government and this administration to go out and address those problems. For Kazi and the keepers of the Keys, all have begun to realize that the fate of their beloved reefs is far more than a Florida affair. The good and bad all flow with the water currents that come to the Keys. And I also have to be looking over my shoulder upstream at the Mississippi River and 40% of North America that drains into the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico, terminus of America's mightiest river, incomparable cradle of life, drawing millions of migrating birds, and the nation's greatest nursery of fish. Yet after decades of neglect, the Gulf has come to symbolize loss. Twice, it has recently served as bullseye for the costliest hurricane and the largest oil spill in U.S. history. Its longer history describes a more insidious decay, its wetlands vanishing by the minute, its water seasonally rendered dead for lack of oxygen. The insults to the Gulf come from all quarters, 
Dredges and channels have diverted the mighty and muddy Mississippi away from the wetlands they once nourished. A gauntlet of industries and cities lining the river's banks have discharged their pollutants, destroying the marsh's seafood nurseries, expanding the dead zone to record size. But just as there are many to blame for the demise of America's greatest coastal wetland, so too there are many rescues now underway to reverse it. One in particular comes from an unlikely team of people in an unlikely place. My name is Dennis Friest. I'm at Radcliffe, Iowa, Central Iowa. We have a family farm operation. We have about 1,450 acres of row crops, and we farrow to finish about 4,500 pigs a year, and we also finish an additional 5,000 feeder pigs a year. Iowa is blessed with some of the most productive soils in the world. Iowa's farmers produce 23 million acres of row crops, mostly corn and soybeans. Almost every acre is put to use producing food and energy. Some people say, well, what does Iowa have to do with the Gulf of Mexico or the ocean anyway? And we say, well, about 200 million gallons every minute. The Mississippi River has a drainage from 31 states. What happens in Iowa, what happens in uh, Nebraska, in Idaho, in West Virginia, that happens to the ocean. There's an enormous impact. Once covered by tall grass prairie and roamed by millions of bison, the Midwest now is a highly modified landscape of industrial agriculture. This new monoculture of row crops releases great quantities of excess nutrients in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus that now washes from Midwestern soils by way of the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. Here, these nutrients create immense blooms of algae whose decaying masses deplete the ocean water of oxygen, every year creating a dead zone the size of Massachusetts, a hypoxic zone that suffocates nearly everything in its path. So we have things that happen right here in Iowa that end up affecting folks thousands of miles away, fishermen trying to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. As we start to figure out how to do a better job, we can lessen that amount of phosphorus that leaves our farms and lessen that amount of nitrogen that leaves our farms. It isn't easy to do as you look at that water wanting to carry those products, but it's something that we can do and been starting to improve, and I think we have some more that we can get done on that. To witness firsthand what it was they were hoping to save, a group of Iowa farmers led by Secretary of Agriculture Bill Northey, boarded a southbound bus and followed their Mississippi River downstream to its meeting with the Gulf of Mexico. I've been doing this for 20 years and I don't think I've had Iowa farmers on a boat. I've had just about everybody else from rock stars to country music singers to Oklahoma tourists, but no Iowa farmers. Taking the bait, but not taking the hooks. It won't go back. Wow. And you push it, and go, that's, his little, that's why they call it trigger fish. See how hard that dorsal fin is? You push that down, it, okay. it comes straight down. I'm basically a fish out of water down here, aren't I? <laughs> Interesting experience. I guess I didn't realize uh, the value of it as far as the, the fishing industry and that sort of thing, how important it is. 
someone had asked me a year or so ago if I would be working with the Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Iowa and, and taking him out on a boat this past weekend, I, I would have said, no, I, there's no way that's going to be happening. But it is, and that's a good thing. Okay. Are so you holding back here? Yes, sir, right here behind wow, They here. are sandy field. Got them? Rough field to them? Yeah. Yeah. It shows that. People throughout the, this country uh, understand that we need to work together to solve problems that extend well beyond the boundaries of our state. Uh, the resources that we manage, our fish, our shrimp, they don't know where state lines are. The governors of the five states bordering the Gulf of Mexico came to realize that each of their economic futures hinged on the health of the same ecological system. Their agreement to preserve that system became the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Basically try to move from a, a system of state-by-state -state governance of, our, of the Gulf of Mexico to one on a more regional basis. And we've extended that partnership up into the watershed of the Mississippi River. And we focused on Iowa first because they were very proactive in their desire to work uh, with us to ultimately reduce nutrient input into the Mississippi River watershed and hopefully reduce or eliminate not only the dead zone that forms every summer off the Texas and Louisiana coast, but also to improve oxygen conditions throughout the Gulf. We're talking about not just doing things differently when you get on your tractor or in your pickup truck in Iowa, we're talking about thinking about things differently. I guess the catalyst that got me going on that was there was money available, funding available in this program that if I reduced my nitrogen 50 pounds the acre and I lost yield, they would reimburse me for the yield that I lost. So I had a, I had a no lose situation. One of the farmers' innovative experiments is aiming to lighten their heavy reliance on fertilizer. The entrepreneurial Dennis Friest was one of the first farmers to take the leap, reducing his fertilizer dose substantially. And we weren't losing any yield. So it was really an eye-opener to say that we are being told by our retailers and industry that we need so much nitrogen to produce a bushel of corn. We're finding out that that was on the high side and that extra pounds we were putting out were actually going to waste and we're going ending up in the Gulf of Mexico in the hypoxia zone. Number one, it's about the environment, but number two, it's also about economics. We're not leaching that nutrient away. We use less to get more, and we use less, which makes the bottom line for us a lot better. It leaves dollars in our pockets. Iowa's commitment to reduce their total farmland runoff by 45% will take a larger effort than using less fertilizer. Much of Iowa's rain-fed cropland is engineered to drain water as fast as possible. Water invariably laden with nitrogen and phosphorus and headed for trouble in the Gulf. Those out to stop the flood of farmland runoff into the Mississippi are now building a series of enormous organic filters, otherwise known as wetlands. Right now, we're developing what's called nutrient reduction wetlands. We've got about 70 of those on the ground now. And these wetlands are placed um, below a farming watershed, and that water then sits in these wetlands for a short period of time. Those wetlands reduce the amount of nitrogen in that water. As that water leaves, it has 40 to 70 percent less nitrogen than it did as it came in. All of these sites are on private lands. It's been very popular in Iowa, and we actually have a two-year waiting list of landowners waiting to proceed with restorations of wetlands on their lands. The limitation is the availability of funding, both federal and state funding under the Farm Bill and state uh, funding sources. This area here, when it's flooded with water, will be, what, 27 
the 37 acres, yeah. something like that. It's, it's got the pack. Yeah. Father and son dairy farmers, Doug and Herman DeWall, are part of a growing cadre of Iowa farmers turned wetland ambassadors. It's going to take cooperation from a from a number of people as well as as state and federal help to get this off the ground because uh, uh, we we've got to start someplace to get this going. It just uh, we just can't go to work and start dumping water and have no uh, uh, responsibility or care about other people. We have to. Everybody's here. We, we need to all work on this project. And there is some places where they may not be able to put one of these in, but maybe we can do a better job here and keep it back more so that the average will be down to where we need to be. To achieve a 45 percent reduction in nitrate will require all of the nitrate reduction practices that we currently have available implemented fully across these landscapes to the extent that they're practical, plus about 2,000 to 3,000 of these nitrogen removal wetlands. It turns out the farmer's workhorse wetlands are serving far higher purposes than mere water filters. Oh, there they are. That's a pair of trumpeter swans. They came into the area about three years ago, the first pair. They've raised several offspring uh, over the last three years. And the story was out that they might have been the first pair that nested outside of captivity in Boone County. And they've come back three years in a row. So I'm pretty proud of them. I've always thought that we got to do everything we can do to try to keep everything rolling and, and, and working, even if it's down in New Orleans. If it's our fault, we want to we wanna fix it. Lifelong Iowan Jim McHugh jumped at the opportunity to establish a wetland on his farm with a sense of stewardship reaching far beyond his property line. I think I'm doing my part to help clean up the Mississippi, and it's only a little part, but it's at least it's a part. Building on little contributions from lots of people, Iowa's farmland fixes have begun to evolve. From simple engineering solutions for nitrogen to an ecological integration of Iowa's native prairie. And some of the major grasses like Indian grass here. This is a, another one of the tall grass prairie species that really uh, is responsible for building organic matter that made our Iowa soils ideal for farming. The Iowa waters feeding the Mississippi were once filtered not only by native wetlands, but also by native tall grass prairie, a natural safeguard since jettisoned by Iowa's new monoculture ecology. So it has become a natural question for landscape ecologist Matt Helmers to ask if tall grass prairie could once again protect the waters of the Mississippi. And one of the things is that people that walk their land, that understand uh, their land, they know where water flows and they know where they might need the most protection. And really then it's trying to get species that are, are diverse, uh, that maybe were, were native to that area, get those planted in that location to reducing that flow of water, um, the rate of flow and reducing some of the, the contaminants or nutrients that are in that water uh, before it flows downstream. Planting strips of native tall grass prairie is another promising method to fight the suffocating hypoxia more than a thousand miles away. This collaboration between Iowa State University and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service shows that these prairie strips provide significant local benefits as well. Keeping soil and nutrients on the farm while creating wildlife habitat. If these practices were adopted broadly, imagine the landscape with strips and borders and boundaries that include diverse prairie. And suddenly, 
We have corridors built into the ag landscape for wildlife. We have uh, corridors that prevent water from being polluted unduly. The first test strips of integrating native prairie in between cornfields yielded astonishing results. Prairie strips can provide a level of benefits no one expected. So we saw about a 90 to 95 percent reduction in that first year in sediment loss and we saw about a 85 to 90 percent reduction in total nitrogen and total phosphorus loss with that surface runoff water. Fewer tons of fertilizer, more acres of wetlands and prairie. All are lightening Iowa's agricultural burden on the Gulf of Mexico without burdening the returns of Iowa's farmers. If you're interested in keeping your farm where the farm's supposed to be and not washing away, this is an excellent program and uh, I highly recommend it. If you like wildlife, if you're thinking about conservation, give it a thought, really give it a thought. He's a fighter. Got one, huh? Got a fish on coming here. He's a big one, I think. Oh, yeah, that's a good size right here. We need a healthy marine environment, and we need resilient coastlines. Increasing water quality, decreasing nutrient introduction, um, increasing and, and restoring and improving habitat function, um, all of those things build toward a, a healthy marine environment. And they don't need to, to come at the cost of economic development. The important thing is that the ecosystem retains its resilience, its ability to survive. And that goes also for the people who live along the coasts. Uh, we want resilient um, communities. We want communities that can withstand floods, withstand hurricanes, withstand other threats that, that may occur, and, and still survive. And so if our, if our human communities, if our animal communities you know, can be resilient, uh, that, that's the most important thing. If we can carry out the plans that we have put in place now, we will achieve those goals. And 20, 25 years from now, we'll, we'll be able to look back and say, boy, we really did a good thing. Along the west coast of North America, from the northern tip of Vancouver Island to Baja, California, runs a great and fertile ocean current. The upwelling waters of the California current, mixing the cold and deep with the warm and shallow, stir the nutrients that feed great congregations of fish and wildlife, as well as the people who make their living here. The California Current unites the coastal life of a continent, the flow of its waters connecting food webs and human communities for 2,000 miles under a single ecological umbrella. But the California Current also flows with increasingly familiar signs of degradation. This coupled with our increasing demands on the ocean brings a special challenge to those who would begin to manage this massive ecosystem with a new perspective. I think marine spatial planning is a really great idea. In California, we've done some of that already when the Coastal Act was passed in 1976. 
one of the concerns I have being here in Southern California is if you look at the plan for the United States for marine spatial planning, you've got the east coast of the U.S. broken into five different regions. On the west coast, we're one big region, you know. And so I think logistically, you know, trying to bring everybody together from a coastline that's so huge, um, it's going to be challenging. It is a challenge now being met by a movement of marine stewardship that is growing along the California current. And the California communities of Ventura, Morro Bay, Elkhorn Slough, and Humboldt Bay, to Port Orford, Oregon, and the San Juan Islands of Washington. On beachfronts, estuaries, rivers, forests, farms, and ranches, people are coming together to re-examine their lifelines to the coast and coming up with local solutions for sustaining them. This new commitment to ocean stewardship is perhaps most intimately witnessed in the coastal village of Port Orford, Oregon, where fishing runs in the blood. When I was uh, little, I guess at 12 years old, and okay, on the weekend, Dad would take me fishing with him. Well, it was Sunday, you know, every Sunday morning, we're supposed to go to church. And I finally got to where, okay, you got an option here. You can either go to Sunday school or you can go fishing with me. Me in a little costume, decorated up like an angel, just wasn't getting it. There was no hands down about it. I'm going fishing. Over the past decades, the Port Orford's fishing community has felt unsettling shifts in its waters. In the decline of salmon and rockfish, and in the boom and bust of its urchin fishery. Disempowered and disenchanted by laws handed down from on high, the fishermen of Port Orford formed the Port Orford Ocean Resource Team, or PORT, an NGO to give them voice in preserving their marine environment. PORT has developed a communal vision to sustain their fisheries and their ecosystem as one. It is a vision of hope forged by hard times. Back when it was timber and fishing and there was some mining um, and things started to collapse, it was really a horrible time for our community. When my husband and I got married, um, we started rolling into a salmon disaster, you know, and then we had a ground fish disaster. We had the collapse of the urchin fishery here. It wasn't looking very good for our future, for even being able to stay and live here around our family that had been here, my family, since uh, the early 1900s. I asked my husband, do you think we're going to be able to stay in fishing? Do you think this is going to work, or does there need to be a plan B? And he was very optimistic. He figured that um, he could you know, continue to fish no matter what would happen, and I felt like he had his head in the sand. I thought that you know, basically things were not looking good for our community at all, especially because we're all small boat fishers. So we decided we were going to have to organize. And believe me, fishermen don't want to get organized. And yet, they did. They knew that it was going to be really important. So they put aside their really individualism that drove them in fishing to want to be out on the water by themselves. And they came to the table, and they said, what are we going to have to do to, to keep fishing and to make management better? What, is, what should our role be, and what could it be? So that's what really kind of started me down this road. I wanted to have some voice in our future here instead of letting you know other people tell us what our future is going to be we wanted to be part of it you know we needed to be proactive to manage our fisheries rather than respond to crises and be you know victim over and over and over 
the Port Orford team didn't wait for the government to impose more regulations. They imposed their own. First of all, we designated a stewardship area, the Port Orford Stewardship Area, which is basically our traditional fishing grounds. We do venture outside of that area, but 90% of the fishing we do takes place within that economic range. So being at the table, a legitimate partner, um, and, and raising our concerns, and that's where the, the stewardship area comes in. We as partners have got to go up through that political ladder and get it done. Port Orford's stewardship area encompasses some 1,300 square miles of state and federal waters, as well as the upland watersheds that feed into them. Here, Port nurtures collaboration to better coordinate conservation and resource management. And so we set both economic and ecological goals for that area. Embrace being proactive on a conservation standpoint, you know, so we were pro-marine reserve when it was time for marine reserve, so we got that taken care of. We also created a MPA adjacent to the marine reserve. Among the area's brightest beacons is the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve, a haven for marine life, including rockfish that can live a century or longer. With this solid foundation in place, the team is working to merge the needs of the Port Orford community with the limits of their sustaining waters. An effort now being touted among the nation's most powerful examples of ocean conservation on the local scale. Port Orford's ecosystem-based project is officially recognized by the state of Oregon. As part of this kind of first ever agreement with a local coastal community to help us really as we move into more and more uh, and, and better science-oriented management of the nearshore marine environment that the state owns and manages. You know, just the fact that we had been on the ocean for all of those years and that many people for that long, uh, we actually um, can propose some really valuable conservation measures based on what we know. Okay, fish on. And so what we're trying to do is use the local knowledge and the science together for conservation. Port has initiated more than a dozen local science projects mapping marine habitat at redfish rocks, analyzing juvenile rockfish habitat, and undertaking the region's first survey for seaweeds. Even in this late collection, we still got 60 different species of uh, seaweeds out there, and about 12 of them were new records to Oregon and some of them may be new species, which we're quite excited about. So when you're looking out at the ocean, the primary producers that provide food for everybody else in the uh, photic areas, I'm not talking about the deep ocean now, but in the photic areas that would be the phytoplankton and the seaweed. So they're very important as being sort of fundamental to the ecosystem out there. So at one time I figured out that it took about a thousand pounds of kelp to make one pound of salmon. And I thought that's something people should learn about because we all value salmon, but if we're gonna have salmon, we have to have things at the bottom of the food chain as well. The team has also taken direct measures to ensure a more sustainable catch. Voluntarily releasing rockfish that are about to spawn. We want to nip in the bed before there's a problem. How long can you go? How long can you catch all the big females? Well, the problem is, is right. it's, it's going to be, soon. before when they realize there's a problem, it's too late. Right. That's what always happens on all the fish. It, we, we, we'd like to address the problem and find out before and address it so we don't have the problem. And then it's going to be released. That's our research reservists came in. We've gotten more scientific study in the last four years than we've gotten all my lifetime down here. And we're going to get a lot more. You know, working on a project right now with acoustic tagging with a grad student from Oregon State University. 
he's um, putting acoustic buoys out in our marine reserve area and uh, acoustic tags in the fish and he's going to be able to tell us that those fish are actually moving out of the reserve if we're protecting the stocks or not and then we can adjust the boundaries of our reserve or change our goals. The deeper the team looked into the future of their fishery, the more they realized they needed to look beyond the sea. To protect their waters, ultimately, they would have to look to the land. I'm Michael Murphy, the city administrator of the city of Port Arford. This is our bioswale project here. Uh, the idea of that is to take and collect all the storm water that comes off of this parking lot with about 100,000 vehicle visits per year. Uh, you can imagine there's quite a bit of pollutants that come in here. Comes in the storm drain here. After it goes through here, it, it works its way into this bioswale and these plants and the soil microbes here detoxify and treat any uh, toxic materials in the water. It helps to clean things up, remove the sedimentation. The purpose of the ordinance is to naturally to improve water quality. And we're one of the few communities that actually has a stormwater ordinance of this nature. The idea is to show people how simple it is to make a great improvement. And you know, it doesn't cost a lot, it's not difficult, it's not expensive, it's fairly easy to do. Aaron Longton, the president of the organization, and I conducted 176 hours of outreach for the stormwater ordinance from February to June of 2009. And the result of that extensive outreach was the ordinance being passed with not, with not a single public comment against the ordinance. And so if we can improve it here, before it gets to the ocean, we've improved the ocean health. And the oceans have been under assault worldwide. It's nice to try to take care of that. So make a little difference in our own spot and maybe others will do the same thing. And ultimately, everything improves. At land here, we have beautiful watersheds that are in pretty good shape. Uh, one in particular that's got a lot of attention is the Elk River, which is the closest to our community here. It has a, a great run of uh, fall salmon that we also depend upon here as a, as a resource. There are a couple wilderness areas up in there that will benefit that ecosystem and keep it intact. All right, buddy, you got it. Point the handle straight up. Point the handle straight up. Pull her in this way. Yeah. Okay. One of the economic staples of Port Orford is the annual fall run of Chinook salmon. <laughs> it is one of the strongest runs remaining along the west coast. It's an Elk River native Chinook, 30 pounds. We just caught it right here out of my friend Bill's hole. Oh, it was teamwork. He netted it, he did a great job. But what a battle. Isn't that a nice one? The salmon that feed Port Orford spawn in the upper reaches of the Elk River. They are living testament to the river's purity, to its clean, cold water, filtered and shaded by the high mountain forests. Right along the wall. While many of the coast's greatest salmon runs are no longer, Just their forests cut, their waters dammed or muddied by erosion, the Elk River salmon still run strong. Best signs, there's lots of jacks. <laughs> I mean, they're almost like a pest, there's so many. They, you can't even get your bait down to the big ones. Boy, that's a fat jack, isn't it? Mm. And the townspeople of Port Orford have taken steps to keep it that way. In 2009, Port Orford made history when Elk River's upper watershed was designated as wilderness and the underwater habitat, known as Redfish Rocks, became Oregon's first marine reserve. The first place where both land and sea received the highest protection possible in the same year. Soon after, the people of Port Orford gathered to celebrate their new ridge to reef wilderness. This river born of rocks in the Klamath and Siskiyou Mountains, flows freely to the sea. The elk's green glow is lit from within. Once in a lifetime, perhaps, a river is loved and then protected. 
We celebrate today the gift of these green waters. Salmon and forest, settler and steward, like a water drop high in the mountains heads to the ocean, we too complete our journey. Today and forever, the elk stays wild and free. The river gods have spoken. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, Jerry, hundreds of others, you listened deeply and you listened well. We needed to bury that tired old idea that loggers and fishing people and ranchers and environmentalists were on different sides. Those days are sort of over. It's clear that people can, from all of those different arenas can come together and make good things happen and that's what's going on here. This is really a, a dream that uh, some in this area have had for well more than a you know quarter of a century uh, to to get some certainty of protection for this absolutely uh, fabulous river, its tributaries, the surrounding uh, mountains and and forests, the old growth, and it's just uh, been a long time coming. But sometimes great things take a long time to get done. Port Orford Elk River area is really interesting if you think about it. We have foresters here who have advocated for wilderness designation for forest, which puts it off limits for logging. So that's um, an interesting thing for a forester to do. And now we have fishermen, commercial fishermen, who are advocating special treatment for the ocean, respect for the resources. I think the change around here will come from the local people who have been here long enough to have a feel for the place and appreciate it and recognize how important it is to sort of turn the, turn the tide before there's nothing left to appreciate. You know, we really need the focus to be on the ocean um, now. It hasn't been in the past, and it's really important. So we see clearly that jobs can go with conservation, that we can continue to fish, let's extract fish from the ocean, and do it right, and have a conservation ethic around how we fish, and, and still have our jobs and, and have our income for our, for our families. I'd like to look at this as kind of a generational aspect. I mean, like my father, there was never any question that there was an abundant timber, abundant fish. That was then, and, and this is now. And my son, he's gonna be faced with different challenges. There you, go. you know, nothing ever got done without one person giving a great idea and moving it forward. So I just think everybody needs to be conscientious and work hard towards a better future. And if everybody is conscientious about it, then slowly things will move in a better direction. There are many lessons for us to learn from these ocean pioneers. The first of which is that their success or failure is ours. We are all, in essence, ocean pioneers, steering uncharted waters in a sea of rapid change. It will take all of us to turn the tide on ocean frontiers from coast to coast. A new way of thinking, a new way of living, in concert with the sea, in consideration, of those yet to come. Now is your opportunity to get involved. <laughs>